Patricia Bonifacio, we will be discussing about the surgical radiographic and endoscopic anatomy of the male pelvis. Next slide, please. For the bony pelvis, um, this is the bony pelvis is consists of the sacrum posteriorly and the paired inanimate bones, which is located posteriorly, um, anteriorly and laterally. So this fusion is centered at the acetabulum, with the ilium forming the upper acetabulum and the ischium forming the posterior inferior acetabulum, and the pubis forming the anterior acetabulum. Uh, the inanimate bones consist of the three fused bones, which is your ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. So for the inanimate bones, uh, this articulate with the sacrum posteriorly at the sacroiliac joint and come together anteriorly to form a cartilaginous joint at the pubic synthesis. Your sacrum is also fixed with two ligaments, your sacred tuberous and your sacred spinous ligament. So the more posterior one, which is your sacred tuberous ligament, uh, this is, is extending from the sacrum to the coccyx up to the ischial uh, tuberosities. And for the more anterior one, which is your sacred spinous ligaments, this connects the sacrum and the coccyx to the ischial spines. So the advantages of these ligaments is this ligament stabilizes the sacrum, allowing only limited upward movement and providing resilience to the sacroiliac joints when the vertebral column um, sustains sudden weight increase. Next slide. Next. So your um. Review slide. Review slide. Sorry. Uh, for the bony pelvis, this is divided by the pelvic rim or the iliopectineal line into the pelvis major and the minor. Your outlet is closed by the coccygeus and your levator ani muscles, which forms the floor of the, pel um, the pelvis. So in normal position, the pelvis is tilted in atomic position. So the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle tubercles are in the same vertical plane. So in a standing position, the pelvis curves obliquely backward relative to the trunk and the abdominal cavity. Next slide. Uh, the pelvis is divided into your greater or the false pelvis and your lesser or the true pelvis. So for the greater or the false pelvis, this is formed by the iliac fossa with the cephalate extending being, being the iliac crest. Then the lesser or the true pelvis usually contains the urogenital organs. So the pelvic outlet or the inferior pelvic aperture is an incomplete bony line roughly forming a circle with its boundaries, being the lower aspect of the symphysis pubis, the ischiopubic rami, the ischial tuberosities, and your secret tuberous ligaments. So you, during pelvic x-rays and fluoroscopies, uh, these bony pelvic landmarks are usually seen with high resolutions and detail. Next slide. So for the true and false pelvis, uh, they're being separated by the arcuate line where it became 
it becomes continuous with the pectineal line of the pubis. So for the bony landmarks, we have here the pubic arc, the pubic synthesis, the ischial tuberosity, and the bony iliac crest, as well as at the L4 vertebra, and can be easily palpated. Next, next slide. Uh, this shows your greater pelvis and your lesser pelvis, which is being separated by your arcuate line. Next slide. So for the pelvic inlet, so or your upper pelvic aperture, the, this is the superior rim of the pelvic cavity is bounded posteriorly by the sacral promontory and the anterior border of the yala of the sacrum. So this is lateral by the arcuate line of the ilium and anteriorly by the pectineal line, the pubic crest, and the superior margins of the pubic synthesis. So this is usually the crossing of the ureters, the gonadal vessels, the middle sacral vessels, your iliolumbar vessels, your lumbosacral trunks, the obturator nerve, and the spermatic cord. Next slide. Next slide. Next. So for the pelvic outlet, uh, which is your lower pelvic aperture, is um, a diamond-shaped aperture bounded posteriorly by your sacrum and your coccyx. It is closed by the pelvic and the urogenital diaphragms. Um, this slide shows the difference between your male pelvis and your female pelvis. We can see that the male pelvis, its shape is an android type of pelvis, having a longer sacrum and a more narrower subpubic arc. Next is for the female pelvis. Uh, it's a gynecoid pelvis that has a wider and a broader sacrum and less prominent ischial spines. Next, we'll show you the slide between the difference of the female and the male pelvis. So in the males, for the bones, uh, the males have a larger, heavier, and thicker bones compared to your female. The pelvic inlet is a heart shape, while the female pelvis is an oval shape. So for the pelvic outlet, uh, Males have a smaller pelvic outlet compared to your female. The pelvic cavity of the male is narrower and deeper. For the sububic angle, it is smaller and lesser for the males. For the sacrum, the males have a longer and narrower. For the obturator foramen, it is shaped in a round form. Next is, I will be discussing about the lower abdominal wall. So for the lower abdominal wall, the skin and the subcutaneous fascia. So the umbilicus indicates the level of the teeth and dermatome at the level of the L3 vertebra. So a skin crease or the inguinal grooves, which usually the semilunar lines, demarcate the lateral borders of the rectus abdominis and your rectus sheath. So this usually indicates the site of inguinal ligament and the groove located just inferior and parallel to this ligament, which marks the division between the anterior abdominal wall and the thigh. Your semilunar lines also extends from the inferior costal margins near the ninth costal cartilages to the pubic tubercles bilaterally. So these three transfer skin grooves may overlie the tendinous intersections of the rectus abdominis muscles. So for the subcutaneous tissues of the lower abdominal wall is, wall is composed of your two layers. So for the fatty layer, which is your superficial one, also known as your campers fascia, your uh, deep membranous layer is known as your scarpus fascia. So um, the scarpa fascia forms a distinct layer that is deep to the campers fascia, 
but blend superficially and laterally with your camper's fascia. So inferiorly, the scarpa fascia fuses with the deep fascia of titai along a line approximately one centimeter inferior and part to the abdomen. It is continuous with the colles fascia of the perineum, which fuses to the ischiopubic rami laterally and the posterior edge of the perineal membrane. Next slide. So for the clinical correlations between your subcutaneous tissues of the scarpa and the campers fascia, so this fascial layers limit of the spread of necrotizing soft tissue infections of the scrotum. Also, the extent of the urinary extravasations and bleeding after anterior urethral injury, blood can accumulate in the scrotum and the penis due to the dartus fascia. So this hematoma is limited by the fusions of the colis fascia to the issue of pubic rami laterally resulting in a butterfly hematoma. This fascia also prevents bleeding, infections, or urinary extravasations from extending down to your legs or into the buttocks. Then they do not limit the spread in the space deep to the scarpa's fascia, thus allowing extensions up to the abdominal wall around the flank or the back. So for the different muscles of the lower abdominal wall, the lower abdominal wall musculature lies deep to the scarpa fascia. So a linea alba is a convenient landmark for lower abdominal incisions. So these three muscles also forms your rectus sheets, which are your external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis muscles. These muscles terminate medially on the anterior abdominal wall as the aponeurotic sheets diffuse in the midline at the linea alba. So at this level, the uh, anterior rectus sheet is formed by the aponeurosis of the external oblique and the portion of the internal oblique. Therefore, the posterior sheet is derived from the remaining internal oblique aponeurosis and the transverse abdominis aponeurosis. Next slide. So below the arcuate line, all aponeurotic layers pass anterior to the rectus abdominis so that at this lower level, the rectus abdominis is covered only by the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum posteriority. So, next slide. The rectus abdominis and the pyramidalis muscles are the important muscles to be discussed here in the lower abdominal wall. So the rectus abdominis attaches to the pubis medial to the pubic tubercle and extends to its insertion on the siphoid process and adjacent costal cartilages. So the muscle fibers of the rectus do not run the length of the muscles. It can be divided transversally without significant retractions. They run between two or more tendinous intersections, which are typically located at the level of the siphoid process of the sternum, the umbilicus, and a level of halfway between these two points. While for uh, Pyramidalis muscles is a small triangular muscle which is absent in 20% of people that lies anterior to the rectus muscle but within its sheath. So it arises from the pubic crest and inserts into the linea alba which tenses its contraction. So this table shows you the different muscles of the pelvic wall and the floor. So for the piriformis, the obturator internus, the levator ani muscles, and the coccyx tissues. Next slide. So your next slide. Sorry. For the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is an inferiorly medial directed oblique passage approximate length 
of 4 centimeters that runs through the inferior part of the anterior abdominal wall. So the inguinal canal transmits the spermatic cord and your ilioinguinal nerve. The deep ring is serves as an inguinal canal. This is the evaginations of the spursalis fascia superior to the ilio to the inguinal ligament and lateral to the inferior epigastric vessels. So to divide the deep inguinal ring, we have the external inguinal ring and the internal inguinal ring. So the external inguinal ring, which is superior lateral to the pubic tubercle, is a slit-like opening in the aponeurosis of the external oblique, serves as the exit from the inguinal canal. While for the internal inguinal ring, this lies midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle above the inguinal ligament and 4 cm lateral to the external ring. Next slide will show you the roof posterior wall, the anterior wall and floor of the inguinal canal. So for the roof, the roof of the inguinal canal is also formed by the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis fibers, which arch over the canal before using the conjoint tendons. Then the floor of the canal is formed laterally by the iliopubic tract, centrally by the superior um, surface of the gutter like inguinal ligament and medially by the lacular ligament. So with contractions of the internal oblique and the transverse muscles, the roof of the canal closes against the floor. This prevents herniations of the intra-abdominal contents into the canal. Uh, hernias into the canal may occur medially or laterally to the inferior epigastric vessels. While for the anterior wall of the inguinal canal, this forms the external oblique aponeurosis throughout the length of the canal that is reinforced laterally by the lowermost fibers of the internal oblique muscles. The posterior wall naman is formed by the transversalis fascia with the posterior medial part of the canal reinforced by the mergings of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis into a common tendon. This tendon reinforces the posterior wall of the inguinal canal at the external ring. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, please. So for the internal peritoneal elevations, the internal peritoneal elevations has a variable amount of extraperitoneal fat and the parietal peritoneum. It, this is covered with the transversalis fascia and below the umbilicus, the abdominal wall exhibits several peritoneal folds, some of which contains the remnants of different fetal vessels. So these folds are identified easily during peritoneal laparoscopic or robotic surgeries. Next slide. The two median umbilical folds lateral to the median umbilical fold cover the medial umbilical ligaments formed by the obliterated umbilical arteries. Your two lateral umbilical folds is the lie laterally to the medial umbilical folds that covers the inferior epigastric vessels as they ascend into the abdominal wall to supply the rectus abdominis muscles. Your median umbilical fold extending from the apex of the bladder to the umbilicus that covers. Oh, sorry, let me go now. Um, next slide, please. For the soft tissues of the pelvis, for the muscles, for the lateral pelvic sidewalls, these are covered and padded, bad, padded by the alterator internus muscles, which exits the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen to insert on the, fo on the femur. 
The medial surface of these muscles is covered by the obturator fascia, which is taken centrally as a tendinous arc extending from the ischial spine to the lower half of the pubis. So this tendinous arc of the levator ani serves as the origin of the muscular limb, which consists of levator ani and your pubococcygeus muscle. The most posterior of the pelvic diaphragm and the lowest and the smallest part is your coccygeus muscle. This extends from the initial spine to the inferior end of the sacrum and the coccyx. So in addition to this, uh, this muscle also flexes your coccyx. Next slide. So for the puberectalis, puberectalis muscles, this forms a U-shaped muscular sling that passes posterior to the anorectal junction. This maintains fetal continence, while your levator ani muscles, which forms the pelvic floor, um, tonically contracted to support pelvic viscera and to maintain fecal and urinary continence. The bulk of the pelvic diaphragm is consists of the levator ani, your puberectalis, pubococcygeus, and then your iliococcygeus muscles. The levator ani muscles also contain both type 1 and type 2 fibers to allow defecations and urinations. Next slide. The pelvic fascia. So the pelvic fascia is a con Connective tissue that is a continuation of the retroperitoneal fascia and fascia that lies between the muscular and the peritoneum layers of the abdominal wall. It can be divided into your parietal pelvic fascia, your visceral pelvic fascia, and your arcus tendinous fascia. For the parietal pelvic fascia, forms the covering of your pelvic organs and their neurovascular supply. Also, this is a membranous layer of variable thickness that lines the pelvic aspects of the muscles, forming the walls and floor of the pelvis. This layer also is continuous with your transversalis fascia. Next is for the arcus tendinous fascia. This forms a junction between your parietal and your visceral fascia. This provides attachment for the condensation of the visceral fascia that provides support to the urethra and the bladder. Your visceral pelvic fascia, on the other hand, is directly in sheets the pelvic organs, forming the adventitial layer of each fascia. For the perineum, the perineal fascia consists of your subcutaneous layer and your membranous layer. For the subcutaneous layer, this is greatly diminished in males, being replaced altogether in the penis and the scrotum with the smooth muscles. It consists of a superficial fatty layer and a deep membranous layer, your collis fascia, and is said to be continuous between the penis and your scrotum and the thighs. While for the membranous layer of the super the membranous layer, this is attached posteriorly to the posterior margins of the perineal membrane and laterally to the fascia lata of the medial thigh. So for the membranous layer, this is continuous with the dartus fascia of the penis and the scrotum and the membranous layers of the subcutaneous tissues of the abdomen. Next slide. For the perineal body, the perineal body it is perforated by the urethra. The anterior aspect of the perineal membrane supports your urethral sphincter and the external genitalia is attached to its inferior surface. The perineal body is an aggregation of the fibromuscular tissue that is located in the midline at the junction between the urogenital and your anal triangles. 
So this is the focal point of pelvic support with nearly every pelvic muscle and fascia inserting into it. Uh, disruption or injury to your perineal body during perineal prostatectomy um, can risk post-operative urinary or possible fetal incontinence to the pain. For the perineum, this refers to the external surface area and the shallow compartment of the body limited superiorly by the pelvic diaphragm, the ball-shaped hypermuscular layer which is formed by the levator ani and coccygeus muscles. By convention, um, the perineum is divided into two triangles, your uro, uh, genital triangle and your anal triangle by a transverse line joined by the anterior ends of the ischial tuberosities. Next slide. So first is the anal triangle. This contains the anal canal and its sphincters and the ischial rectal fossa and its contained nerves and vessels. It is lined by superficial and your deep fascia. So for the subcutaneous fatty tissue of the anal triangle that surrounds your anus, it is continuous with the subcutaneous fat of the urogenital triangle, the buttocks, and the thighs. While for the ischorectal fossa, which is filled with fat and extends anteriorly to a recess above the urogenital diaphragm, this is bounded by the levator ani medially and the obturator internus and sacro tuberous ligaments laterally. It also extends posteriorly into the pelvis through the sciatic foramina. Next. Part of your anal triangle is your anal canal, which begins where the ampulla of the rectum abruptly narrows at the level of the U-shape, sling formed by the puberectalis muscles. This is surrounded by the internal and external anal sphincters. For the internal anal sphincter and the external anal, for the internal, so its tonic contraction is maintained by your sympathetic nerves and is lessened by your parasympathetic nerves, allowing to expand passively during defecation. Your external anal, on the other hand, is the subcutaneous portion of the perineal body and the coccyx, and the deep portion blends with the puberectalis sling of the levator ani. A disruption of this muscle band results in fetal incontinence. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> Next is for the urogenital triangle. The urogenital triangle, it is enclosed by the scrotum anteriorly and the perineal body posteriorly. The skin and the subcutaneous fat overlay coles fascia, which attaches posteriorly to the perineal membrane with the perineal body in the center forming a superficial pouch. So deep to this pouch lies in the root of the penis with the paired corpora cavernosa attaching to the inferior ischiopubic rami and the perineal membrane and the corpus congiosum of the bulbar urethra attaching to the perineal membrane. While for the bulb of the pen, penis is surrounded by the bulbous pongiosus muscle. So contraction of these muscles compresses the corpora cavernosa during penile erection. Um, the internal pudendal artery and its branches supply the perineum. After branching from the internal iliac artery, the internal pudendal artery travels through the lesser sciatic foramen, medial to the obturator internus in the Alcock canal. It sends branches also to the anus and then travels through collis fascia into the superficial pouch of the urogenital triangle and the posterior scrotum before terminating as the dorsal artery of the penis.
the internal pudendal veins, on the other hand, anastomose with the dorsal venous complex in the pelvis through your plexus on a lateral surface of the prostate and cause bleeding during prostatic dissections. And obstructions of the of either the portal circulation from the inferior mesenteric section can result in dilatations of the venous plexus and can cause hemorrhoid formations. The, inter, in the inferior rectal veins arise from the inferior pudental vein and anastomose with the superior rectal vein, which eventually drain to the inferior mesenteric veins. Thank you. So for the circulation and innervation, this will be discussed by PJI Patricia Bonifacio. Good morning, doctors. So to discuss the second part of our reporting, we have the circulation and innervation of the male pelvis. The following slide um, table contains the main arteries of the pelvis and demonstrates important branches which supply the different organs found in the male pelvis. We will be discussing these um, arteries in the next few slides. At the aortic bifurcation, the middle sacral artery travels to the anterior sacrum, where it supplies the rectum and the sacral foramina. It may be encountered during dissection of the presacral space. The common iliac arteries course anteriorly to the common iliac veins and split into an external and internal branch at the level of the sacroiliac joint. So in this slide, we will see the bifurcation of the artery and the respective branching of the internal iliac and the, and the external iliac arteries. The external iliac artery sits anterolateral to the vein and on top of the iliopsoas muscle. It eventually crosses under the inguinal ligament where it becomes the femoral artery as demonstrated in this figure to our right. The still branches of the external iliac artery may be encountered during pelvic lymph node dissection, which include the inferior epigastric artery and the deep circumflex iliac and pubic branches. The internal iliac or the hypogastric artery, on the other hand, travels posteriorly after branching from the common iliac artery to supply the deep structures in the pelvis. It is divided as well into the anterior and posterior trunks. The umbilical artery is typically obliterated after its takeoff from the internal iliac artery and becomes the medial umbilical ligament along the anterior abdominal wall. So in this figure, we will see the internal iliac artery and its branching into the umbilical artery and the smaller tributaries. The superior vesical artery arises from the umbilical artery proximally and supplies the bladder along with the inferior vesical artery. The artery of the vas deferens, on the other hand, also comes from a branch of the umbilical artery as mentioned and joins the cremasteric and testicular arteries in the spermatic cord, thus providing an additional blood supply to the testicles of the male. The obturator artery, finally, supplies the adductor muscles of the thigh and travels through the obturator foramen and can be encountered deep and medial to the obturator nerve, particularly during, again, pelvic lymph, lymph node dissection. For the venous drainage of the pelvis, the pelvis has a, rich, has a rich venous network. The external and internal iliac veins course inferior and medial to their corresponding arteries, as mentioned prior, and join together behind the internal iliac artery, where they can be injured during pelvic lymph node dissection, thus resulting in significant bleeding. The dorsal venous complex, which is pictured in this slide, drains the penis and enters the pelvis with the pubic symphysis to the striated sphincter and then divides into a central superficial branch as seen here and a deeper plexus. It is important to control when performing prostatectomy to minimize the bleeding. However, this maneuver may sometimes damage the sphincter, particularly in the lateral segment. The prostatic penis plexus, also known as the Santorini plexus, drains the prostate and part of the rectum and may be encountered when entering the lateral prostatic fascia. It drains into the interior, internal iliac vein along with several other inferior vesicle, vesicle veins. 
After the lymphatic drainage of the structures in the male pelvis, the drainage from the pelvic viscera includes the iliac lymph nodes and its tributaries. It is important to note that there is frequent cross-drainage between the left and the right sides of the pelvis. The external iliac lymph nodes drain the anterior abdominal wall, uracus, and the bladder. The most distal portion of the node packet is and it exits the femoral canal and serves as the distal limit of pelvic lymph node dissection. So this is an important structure in surgery as it is the distal limit, once again, of pelvic lymph node dissection. So here is another view of the node of cloquet um, as demonstrated in the previous slide. The internal iliac lymph nodes receive drainage from the prostate and the bladder. Presacral and obturator lymph nodes also drain into the internal iliac lymph node chain. The inguinal lymph nodes serve to drain the external genitalia and they drain into the iliac lymph nodes. For the innervation of the male pelvis, the, the lumbosacral plexus provides sensation to the pelvis and the genitalia. It has um, several branches, which include the iliohypogastric, the ilioinguinal, the genitofemoral nerve, which has genital and femoral branches. The iliohypogastric nerve originates from L1 to supply the anterior abdominal wall. The ilioinguinal nerve also originates from L1 and travels through the inguinal canal, providing sensation to the anterior scrotal skin. The genitofemoral nerve arises from both L1 and L2, and splits into genital and femoral branches, as seen in this slide. It travels over the anterior surface of the psoas muscle. The genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve travels through the inguinal canal to supply the femasteric muscle and the anterior scrotum. On the other hand, the femoral branch provides a sensation to the anterior thigh. The femoral nerve serves as both motor and sensory innervation to the Five. The femoral nerve comprises of branches from L2 to L4 and contributes sensation to the anterior thigh and motor innervation to the extensors of the thigh. It travels deep within the psoas muscle that can be injured during psoas hitch or a, pro, um, a part of surgery wherein the pressure from the retractor blades during laparotomy or during inguinal lymph node dissection may impinge on this, on this specific nerve. The obturator nerve, on the other hand, provides motor, uh, motor innervation to the adductors of the thigh. It originates from L2 to L4 and is first apparent between the internal iliac vessels and the pelvic side wall at the bifurcation of the common, common iliac vessels. It travels anteriorly through the obturator canal, and damage to this structure can occur during pelvic lymph node dissection, resulting in difficulty of adduction of the thigh. The sacral plexus is formed by the lumbosacral trunk, from, which derives from L4 and L5, and the sac sacral segmental nerves, and is located between the internal iliac vessels and the piriformis muscle. It then travels through the greater sciatic foramen to innervate the lower leg and the posterior thigh. So this slide is a summary of the nerves, which, which provide somatic and autonomic innervations in the structures in the pelvis. The autonomic nerves of the pelvis. Um, the sympathetic nerves of the pelvis originate in the lateral horn of the thoracic and lumbar spinal cord, which comprises T10 to L2, and then travel to the pelvis through the superior hypogastric plexus and the sympathetic chain. The hypogastric plexus is a continuation of nerve fibers from the celiac plexus and the lumbar sympathetic nerves. It eventually becomes two discrete gastric nerves that travel anteriorly to the aorta and medially to the internal iliac artery into the pelvis beneath the endopelvic fascia. The sympathetic trunks are located lateral to the vertebral bodies and these continue behind the iliac vessels and terminate in front of the coccyx. On the other hand, the parasympathetic nerves of the pelvis come from the lateral horns of the sacral spinal cord comprising S2 to S4 and join the sympathetic hypogastric plexus to form the pelvic plexus. The pelvic plexus, as, this, as this shown in this slide, 
is on either side of the rectum, centered around the seminal vesicles, thus in innervating the rectum, the bladder, neck, and the distal ureter. Distally, this structure innervates the prostate and continues as the cavernosal nerves that run posterior lateral to the prostate on the surface of the rectum outside the denondilias fascia. The static arteries and veins travel with these nerve The neuron in seven o'clock position at the apex of the prostate and then sends branches to the striated sphincter and corpora cavernosa to supply erectile tissue. Therefore, damage to the neurovascular bundle or the pelvic plexus during prostatectomy or erectile resection may result in erectile dysfunction of the patient. Next, we will be discussing the pelvic viscera. The rectum starts at the level of S3 and follows the curvature of the sacrum through the pelvic pore, then terminates in the perineum as the anus. At the anterior portion, the rectum is covered with peritoneum distally up to the rectal vesicle pouch. Beyond the rectal vesicle pouch, it is now known as the denondilier fascia, which separates the rectum from the prostate. Incision of this peritoneum allows access to the seminal vesicles posterior to the bladder and is commonly performed in the posterior approach to robotic prostatectomy. The blood supply of the rectum is the middle rectal artery, which derives from the internal iliac artery, and the inferior rectal artery, which derives from the internal pedental artery. The rectum is innervated by the pelvic plexus. And the ampulla, which was mentioned by my co PGI a while ago, is the most distal portion of the rectum, wherein the rector urethralis muscle is found. The ampulla is the most common location of rectal injury at the time of prostatectomy. Next, we have the bladder. The bladder is mostly an extraperitoneal organ. It is covered by peritoneum superiorly and the superior portion is in continuity with the reractus, which is a fibrous embryologic structure typically lying with epithelium but obliterated in the adult. Um, laterally, it is surrounded by the LCP and adipose tissue. Anteriorly, anterior to the bladder is a space of rates use. Later, we will discuss this once again. This is used and is important in surgical dissection in order to access the bladder or the prostate. Posteriorly, the ureters enter alongside the seminal vesicles and the vasa deferentia. The space of reds used is a potential extraperitoneal space that lies deep to the transversalis fascia and is often developed by surgical dissection in order to access, once again, the bladder or the prostate. So this is an image of the frontal section of the male bladder, demonstrating the different layers and the lining of the structure. The bladder is supplied by the vesical artery and branches of the hypogastric artery, while the venous drainage for the structure is served by the venous plexus, which drains into the internal iliac vein. The lymphatics of the bladder demonstrate significant cross drainage from the bladder, which with drainage to both sides, again, the left and the right sides of the pelvis. The innervation of the bladder has both parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation. However, it has a higher density of parasympathetic cholinergic nerve endings with relatively little sympathetic innervation. Efferent fibers come from the anterior portion of the pelvic plexus. Um, there are also non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic fibers that innervate the bladder and are thought to use purines as neurotransmitters. While their contribution to normal bladder contraction is relatively small, pathological situations, these receptors may be pharmacologic targets for um, intervention with use of supplementary drugs. The ureterovesical junction. Um, the ureters are encased by fibrous tissue, known as the Waldeyer sheath, as they enter the trigon. The entrance is cephalad and lateral, and the ureter travels 1.5 to 2 centimeters before reaching the ureteral orifice which is located caudal and medial to its insertion in the bladder. The intramural ureter that travels through the detrusor is narrow, 
and can be a site of obstruction in the setting of ureteral stones or significant bladder wall thickening. Because of the strong detrusor muscle backing, the intramural ureter is occluded during bladder filling, acting as a one-way valve for urine flow. The, ret um, the pelvic ureter is retroperitoneal in location and begins as it crosses the common iliac artery. It travels laterally towards the pelvic sidewalls and then beneath the umbilical artery branch of the internal iliac artery. It then turns into the And we know that the ureter has junctions or narrowings prone to obstruction by stones or by other constrictions. Next, I will be discussing the endoscopic anatomy of the male pelvis. So this is a very short segment. In endoscopy, the male bladder and urethra are easily visualized in awake patients provided with local analgesia. Um, in endoscopy, there is complete visualization of the male bladder, including the ureteral orifices and the trigon. The bul bulbar urethra is a co-optation of the extrinsic urethral sphincter, evident just beyond the verumonantum. This is an important structure in transurethral resection of the prostate for benign prostatic enlargement or hypertrophy. So endoscopy in males can identify sources of hematuria and localized bladder tumors. It can be used to assess for intravesical protrusions of the prostate and to more readily identify small bladder tumors. The bulbar urethra is important because the resection in this area can damage the sphincter and thus result in incontinence. Next, for the radiographic anatomy of the male pelvis. Shown here is a pelvic radiograph of a male, demonstrating the different um, structures. And as you can see, the distinct shape, part shape, um, the distinct shape of the male pelvis when compared to the female pelvis. Individual pelvic organs are generally poorly depicted in radiographs due to their similar densities. However, calcifications in the male pelvis are well visualized. The plevolith is a normal finding seen in up to 44% of pelvic radiographs. It has no clinical relevance but is important to recognize as they may mimic distal ureter or bladder stones. In fluoroscopy, um, we may visualize normal fluoroscopic cystogram findings versus abnormal um, cystogram findings. So, in normal bladder fluoroscopy, the empty bladder lies at just above the pubic synthesis. And as the bladder progressively fills with instilled contrast material, as seen in this picture, the bladder extends superiorly into the false pelvis. Generally, the bladder stretches to occupy the lateral and anterior false pelvis, extending towards the lateral pelvic sidewalls. Upon voiding, the posterior urethra should be seen as a well-distended tube, resulting from complete relaxation of the involuntary and voluntary urethral sphincter. In an abnormal fluoroscopy, we may note lack of bladder distension, which may be caused by a space occupying pelvic mass or fluid collection, classically resulting from extraperitoneal pelvic hematomas in the setting of pelvic trauma or lymphocytes and hematomas after radical prostatectomy. In this photo, um, we see an oblique spot image of the pelvis obtained during voiding cystourethrography showing the bladder and urethral and bony anatomy of the male pelvis. The posterior urethra is best imaged by retrograde urethrogram formed in the oblique position. Um, this, comprises, this is comprised of the membranous urethra and the prostatic urethra. The membranous urethra passes through the urogenital diaphragm and the prostatic urethra extends from the bladder base to the urogenital diaphragm. In computed tomography or C scan, um, this may be used to obtain volumetric data sets that can be reconstructed in any plane for viewing. Most common planes are which the actual coronal and sagittal views of the male pelvis. CT provides high anatomic detail or high anatomic imaging of the pelvis, thus allowing for easy detection of various pathological conditions. This has relatively low contrast resolution compared to the MRI and often requires the use of IV contrast. 
IV contrast um, is uh, most often used. However, the general exception to this rule is in imaging neurolithiasis, in which your intravenous contrast is unnecessary because the stones attenuate without contrast in computed tomography, resulting in high contrast differences compared to the soft tissues in its surroundings. This is another image of a three-dimensional reformatted CT of the male pelvis derived from a CT urogram, showing the relationship of the ureters to the vascular and bony structures in the pelvis. Inspiration of pain, infectious disease, stone disease, post-operative complications, and staging of known malignancies. Detection of primary urologic malignancy, however, is limited with most urologic tumors only seen at advanced local stages. It is important to know the peritoneal and extraperitoneal spaces which may be visualized in computed tomography or CT scan. So as mentioned before, the space of its use is an important space in the male pelvis. The abdominal, um, it is seen at CT anterior to the bladder. It communicates with lateral perivesicular vis spaces, both of which contain um, adipose tissue and vessels. Leaked urine may accumulate in these spaces in the setting of extraperitoneal bladder rupture. It is a possible site of infiltration in advanced bladder cancer. The retrovesical space, on the other hand, is a common site site of fluid accumulation or post-operative abscess formation because this is the most dependent portion of the peritoneum. So this is a picture um, demonstrating the peritoneal and extraperitoneal spaces in the male pelvis. Noted to be shaded green in the illustration. Finally, CT is useful in lymph node evaluation. And this is an important diagnostic to be used or given for patients with urologic malignancies. Lymph nodes are well visualized by CT because of their spatial resolution. Normal lymph nodes appear as small, as smooth, oval, or elongated homogeneous soft tissue densities. They may also show fat density in the hilum where the vessels traverse. Finally, we have the MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging, of the male pelvis. MRI shows more detailed muscle and soft tissue anatomy in comparison to the CT. This is because of the higher soft tissue contrast resolution that MRI has. The pelvic organs, pelvic floor muscles, intervening fascia, vessels, and nerves are all well depicted in MRI. Most MRIs are performed in multiple anatomic planes using a combination of T1 and T2 weighted images with and without saturation impulses applied. In general, T1 weighted images are best for evaluating osseous or bony structures and muscles and demonstrating post-contrast enhancement. On the other hand, we have T2 weighted images which show detailed organ anatomy and muscles is a very sensitive um, contrast to fluid, therefore showing edema, inflammation, and possible fluid collection in you know, retrovesical spaces mentioned prior. P2 weighted MRIs afford the best anatomic imaging assessment of the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, and the supporting structures to both. MRIs may also be used to closely evaluate the pelvic floor. There is such a thing as a dynamic floor, pelvic floor MRI, which can be useful in assessing muscle tone and continence since um, the movement or the lack thereof of these muscles can be visualized in dynamic pelvic floor MRI. In such an MRI, the internal, external sphincters are seen as separate or distinctly separate structures with T2 weighted imaging. We can visualize in this um, illustration in this slide, the distinct images of the corpus cavernosum and the corpus spongiosum. This picture was, um, this image is taken with actual T2-weighted MRI through the perineum below the pelvic floor, which shows the relationship of the base of the penis to the muscles and the anal sphincter. 
Anteriorly, below the urogenital diaphragm or triangle, the base of the penis is seen with the corpus cavernosa, as in this slide, appearing as bright, almost fluid-intense fluid -intense structures due to their vascular contents. The midline corpus spongiosum appears similarly, and generally, the bulbous urethra wall can be seen as a faint, dark outline within thin, linear, T2 dark fibers of the ischemia ischial cavernosus and bulbous ponchosus muscles are also seen in this image, basal and sponchosum relatively. So this is the end of our presentation. These are our references. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay. Meron uh, pa tayong isang lecture? Ito na lang, no? Huwag ka 12 naman eh. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you, Dr. Baronia at Dr. Bonifacio for the outstanding uh, lecture regarding the topic na uh, surgical radiographic and endoscopic anatomy of the male pelvis. Actually, very precise and detailed siya. So, uh, parang wala naman akong question doon dahil napakaganda naman ng pagkakagawa ng, uh, ng report. So, more or less, yung the topic discusses the anatomic aspect of the male pelvis. So, very nice to know lang yan sa mga interns. But, uh, syempre, significant dyan yung mga yung fascia, musculature, blood supply, nerve supply. So, siguro, Wally, for example, kung gusto nyo mag-surgeon, magandang ano yan, uh, dapat alam nyo yung mga regarding sa topic na diniscuss. But kung na yung intern level, siguro yung mga yun lang, yung mga basic lang, like yung blood supply, nerve supply, yung musculature, yun lang yung mga origin and point of insertion. Yun yung mga maganda siguro uh, tandaan regarding sa topic. Uh, so, I guess, uh, okay na yun. Sir Rome, ikaw may question ka? Uh, may sobra sila raya na, ano, eh, na dalawang lecture. Ang suggestion ko, if ever okay sa kanilang ituloy sa Friday, kung I am na kasi sila eh, pero kung wala naman kayong gagawin, I think may two lectures pa na basic. Sayang naman yung nag-prepare kung hindi sila mag-prepare. So, let's give them a chance. Kung wala kayong gagawin ng Friday, 